to see you all here on this uh, kind of muggy day, actually. Somebody said it reminded them more about eastern Nebraska this morning when they got up with all the fog and everything that was in the air. But uh, it's great to have you here today for our time of worship, and the air conditioning is working. Too bad for that. Well, as we begin our time of uh, worship, let's all stand together and let's join in singing hymn number 294, Bring Your Vessels, Not a Few.
Please join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. During our prayer time this morning, we have a couple of uh, requests that we need to add to our uh, prayer needs. First of all, Aggie Wiederholt, most of you know her, she moved away uh, some time ago, but was with us for quite a number of years. She's living up in Custer, Wyoming. We've just uh, received word that Aggie has been placed on hospice. And uh, so I think we all kind of know, you know, what that generally means and uh, she's Aggie is what 96 I think it is years old and just a beautiful beautiful lady that has been such a blessing and let's just remember Aggie and her family um, in prayer and also uh, a young man and he's about 40 years old in his 40s Darlene uh, Darlene Deed's nephew Rick lives back in the eastern part of the United States, has been diagnosed with throat cancer, and it's stage four, so uh, it is not good. So let's uh, lift up these two in addition to the other prayer needs that we have before us. Father, we are grateful today to you that we can come, and we can have this time uh, in our service when we can spend a little time in prayer, bringing our requests before you. Prayer is such an important part of the teaching in the Bible. And you've told us, Lord, that we should come to you boldly to the throne of grace in faith and trusting you and believing that you do hear our prayers. You don't always answer our prayers the way that we would like them to be answered, but, but you do hear them and you do answer our prayers in the way that is best for all concerned. Father, we pray today for the special needs that we have before us. We do want to lift up Aggie to you. We love this dear sister in the Lord. and We just pray that you will be with her during this time of her life. She, uh, she, we know that she knows you. And we know that she has a, a future and a hope through Jesus Christ. So be with Aggie and her family today in a special way. We pray also for Rick today, Father, with this devastating turn of events in his life. Father, we, we know that uh, you are a, a God who heals and, and touches lives, and that's what we pray for Rick, Lord, that you would bring a healing to him. And we pray that he will reach out to you and, and uh, find your help and your strength during this time. We also want to continue to lift up uh, Lucille to you today, Lord, and, and Don and Noni. We thank you for these dear folks, and we pray that you will bless their lives. Father, we pray today that you will be with uh, all of our church family, wherever they are today. We, we're just uh, so thankful that we have a beautiful sanctuary that we can come and worship in, and as we're looking at the, uh, the beautiful stained glass windows and and considering their meeting for us, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will just uh, awaken within each one of us something new and something special as we uh, look at these beautiful windows. We pray, Father, that you will be with our farmers and our ranchers. And Lord, we know that this is a very precarious time, the planting season and the growing season uh, and the potential for storms. Only you know what you have uh, in store for the land and what's going to take place. But Father, we pray that you will be with 
our farmers, be with the land, that you will bless the land and that we will have a prosperous year uh, in, uh, in the, in the uh, crops that are grown, Lord, and the cattle that are raised and so forth, Lord. And it will be a good year for farmers because they need it so much. And Father, we pray that you will be with our country. We are looking very uh, carefully and with great interest to the summit that uh, President Trump is having with the North Korean leader. Father, we just pray that there will be a resolution there. Peace will finally come to that region and people won't be living constantly on the verge of, of war and threat. We just pray that you will work through this situation. Be with President Trump and the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, Lord, and just uh, lead them and guide them. And all of those, we know there's a lot of people involved on both sides of this issue and other countries too. And we just pray that you will work in this situation and bring about peace and safety for that region, but also for our country too and the rest of the world. We pray, Father, you'll be with our local uh, communities. We pray for our county uh, government, for our commissioners, for our city council members and mayors. We pray for our policemen today, Father, and the firemen. Uh, these individuals are uh, heroes every day and they go out and face the dangers that they face to keep our country safe and there are so many problems and issues that are taking place that they that they face every day we pray for their protection and their wisdom we pray that you will be with our community and that the love of Jesus Christ will will become the norm in our community and people will truly be uh, individuals who know what who really know what it means to have peace with Jesus, peace with you through what Jesus did for us upon the cross. We pray, Father, today that you will guide and direct us as we continue our time of worship. And together we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
because of the witness of the Holy Spirit within us is that Jesus is our Savior. That is the blessed assurance that we have when we place our faith in Him. We can know that He is there because His Word says His Spirit will bear witness with our Spirit. So let's sing this great old hymn of the church. Blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Purchase of God. Born of His Spirit. Washed in His blood. This is my soul.
we're going to continue with the uh, second of our sermons on the uh, windows, the stained glass windows. And uh, I had mentioned last week, I think, about we're going to try to look up and see if there's any record of when these were made or anything like that. Well, this morning, Pam found a whole file folder about that thick with everything in it about when these windows were done, and it's just a gold mine. And uh, I'm going to be including information from that uh, in the book. So uh, you'll want to be able to, you want to get that and be able to see and have some of that history there. It's pretty awesome. They even have samples of stained glass in there that they were looking at and chose from. And I even think there's a sample of the old window that used to be in here uh, in that too. So uh, it's pretty awesome. Really, uh, really thankful for that uh, information that's available to us. Now, how many of you were not here last Sunday? Don't be ashamed to raise your hand. It's okay. Um, because I, I wanted to see, to see how much I needed to kind of uh, uh, review. I want to, uh, first of all, just share with you uh, about the windows being a representation of the life of Christ. And when you look at the windows, you begin with the back window on this side. This is the east side. Window number one is the top window uh, in the back. And then it progresses from there. You go top window, bottom window, the next window, then top window, bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom. And then you turn to this side, and the progression continues with the back window on the top, just like it did on this side. So the back window on the top, it goes top, bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom. And the last window is this one right in the front, the cross with the crown around it. So that's the progression in which the, uh, the windows go uh, for the illustration of the life of Christ. And I want to go through each window each week just briefly. I want to just show you what they represent, just a brief statement of what each window represents because my hope is by the time we get through with the uh, all of the windows that we, we'll have reviewed them enough that you will know what every window represents. So that if somebody you have somebody, a relative or a friend, or somebody comes to church is not familiar with it, and they look at the windows and say, oh, what beautiful windows those are. You, you can say, yeah, that one right there, that is, and be able to explain it to them and, and share with them the significance of that window. So first of all, our window number one is the birth of Jesus. We covered that one last week, and we also covered number two, which was the visit from the wise men. Window number three is the uh, dedication of Jesus, and number four is the baptism of Jesus. And that's those two are we're going to be covering in detail today. Window number five is the calling of the, the disciples. Number six is the church built upon the rock. Seven is the transfiguration of Jesus. Eight is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now number nine and number ten, I mentioned to you, they, they are, these are the two windows that are out of order. Uh, number nine is Gethsemane and number ten is the Last Supper. The actual order should be the Last Supper and then Gethsemane. I don't know what happened there, but don't, these two are out of order, but that's, that's okay. Uh, number 11 is the crucifixion. Number 12 is the resurrection. Number 13 is the ascension of Jesus. Number 14 is Pentecost. <clears throat> Number 15 is Jesus as the Alpha and Omega. And then number 16 is Jesus as the King of Kings. And there's, there's more to those windows than just those simple uh, definitions and actually I stated it's the, the life of Christ that actually goes <clears throat> through <clears throat> the uh, establishment of the early church into the book of Acts the last few windows there so uh, they're wonderful beautiful windows for us to observe 
We, uh, we looked last week at the birth of Jesus and uh, we, we uh, pointed out the uh, key row that, that looks like chai row, but it's key row. That's, that, those are Greek letters. The, uh, the, uh, the X there that is forming the uh, manger is the key. It's, it's pronounced K in the Greek. And that's, that's the letter, the key. The rho is the one that comes up and it shows, looks like a P. That's the R sound, the rho. They form the first two letters of Christ, which is in the Greek there, Christos, is that those Greek letters there below the key rho. Those, that is Christos. We, uh, and so we learned about the key role last week with the birth of Jesus. And then we looked at the wise men and studied a little bit about them and the, the different uh, gifts that they brought to the Lord Jesus Christ as represented in the second window. Well, today we're going to look at, first of all, the dedication of Jesus. Window number three. It uh, shows the Star of David hovering over a basket containing two birds. The symbolism here is beautiful and well conceived. The window is depicting the dedication of Jesus 40 days after his birth. And we find the scripture text for that in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now from this passage we know that Joseph was not a wealthy man. In fact, he must have been quite poor. The original command in the law of Moses required the sacrifice of a lamb without blemish, but allowed for the substitution of two turtle doves or young pigeons if the family was poor. We see that in Leviticus chapter 12. And he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, either male or female. And if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean. Now the Star of David indicates that Mary and Joseph were observing this Jewish uh, religious practice, their, their uh, obligation. It was an obligation. And it is also, the Star of David is also emblematic of Jesus, the Messiah, being a descendant of David as prophesied. In uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, 12 and 13, the prophecy over David is given, when your days are fulfilled and you, David, lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now the basket that is under the uh, Star of David, containing the two turtle doves, represents the offering Mary and Joseph brought to present to the chief, to the priests for the dedication ceremony. There are a couple other people in this story that are, uh, are significant and need to be recognized for our story to be complete. First of all, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child in, 
Jesus, to do for him according to the law and the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. In the light for revelation, it is a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. What a prophecy. This had to be an amazing event for Mary and Joseph. Another confirmation of who their precious child was. Now, let's meet the other person that is of significance here. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up to that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak to him of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And the favor of God was upon him. An interesting little uh, tidbit kind of popped out at me as I was looking at this uh, passage. And it said that they returned to their own town of Nazareth. That was where Mary and Joseph were, uh, had their home. But where was Jesus born? <coughs> Bethlehem. Remember, Joseph had to go to Bethlehem to be counted in the census. Herod had, had commanded that everybody had to go to the, their ancestral home, in which case, this case, it was Bethlehem for Joseph <clears throat> to be counted in a census that he was taking. And so it was in Bethlehem that the prophecy was fulfilled and that Jesus was born. And the thought occurred to me, remember last week we talked about the wise men uh, coming later than when Jesus was born because it says they came to the house. So they must have moved into a, a house after Jesus was born. You would assume that they wouldn't have been staying in the, living in the stable uh, except maybe spending the one night there. And then Joseph no doubt found a house. But they had to have come before this 40-day period and they went to Jerusalem because it says they went to Bethlehem and they found the child there and they gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And so that raised the question in my mind, well, if they had all that gold and the frankincense and myrrh that was very, very expensive and valuable, then why were they still considered to be poor when they went to, to Jerusalem to take Jesus there. Uh, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, we could speculate, you know, we could say there be, could be a lot of speculation about that. But uh, but they were still, whatever the, whatever the issue, the situation was, they were still poor enough that they uh, could only afford the uh, two turtle doves for, for the uh, dedication of Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem. And then they went home to... Uh, Nazareth, And I, I was thinking about that trip home, uh, Mary holding her baby close to her as they made their way back to their hometown in Nazareth. Her mind must have been reeling with thoughts of what happened in the temple. To them, they were just fulfilling the Jewish law. They were going to the temple to do what, to do what uh, uh, 
the law said that they needed to do. But amazing things took place there with Simeon and Anna uh, giving these words over their child. Her mind must have just been absolutely filled with the excitement of, of that visit. Let us also imagine and let our minds reel with what that baby ultimately did for us, dying on the cross for our sins and giving us hope. This brings us next to window uh, number uh, four. I say it says three on there, but it's actually window number four. Uh, which beautifully depicts the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been preaching a gospel of repentance, calling people to turn from their wicked ways and do what was right. And so it was a bit surprising to him when Jesus, who he apparently recognized as the Messiah, came to him to be baptized. Let's look at the narrative as found in the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. According to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was about 30 years old when he was baptized. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? That was a question that John the Baptist asked, wasn't it? He, he didn't quite understand. He was preaching a message of repentance for your sins. But he knew that Jesus didn't fit into that category. Well, Jesus was baptized to show his complete willingness to do the will of his Father, to complete the mission he had come to do. Billy Graham offers us some uh, good words about this. He wrote, no, Jesus didn't need to repent for his sins because in all the history of the human race, he alone was completely sinless. The reason is because he was God in human flesh, sent from heaven on that first Christmas to save us from our sins. Why then? Did Jesus seek out John and be baptized by him in the Jordan River? The reason is because Jesus, who is the sinless Son of God, took upon himself your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole human race, just as, just as, er, human race, period. Just as he didn't have to die, so he didn't have to be baptized until he came to be the bearer of all our sins. This he did by coming to earth for us. In other words, from the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus demonstrated that he was the promised Messiah. And in the words of John the Baptist, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. His baptism was a sign of this great truth. It was confirmed immediately by a voice from heaven declaring, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Matthew 3, 17. No, Jesus didn't need to repent, but we do. For we have sinned. And our only hope is Christ and his sacrifice for us. Have you opened your heart and life to his forgiveness and his cleansing power? Well, this brings us now to the artistic portrayal in the window. Here we see a dove descending upon a cross with a rather peculiar looking symbol fanning out from it toward the water below. The dove is easy to explain as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. 
the cross is also understandable. But what is that symbol in the middle? It was somewhat baffling to me until I counted the number of fingers coming out of it. Seven. Seven is the number of completeness and perfection, both physical and spiritual. Remember what the voice from heaven said? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus was the complete sinless man who was to become the lamb without blemish as a sacrifice for the sins of all people, including you and me. As you gaze upon this window, let the fullness of that truth impact your life. Father, we thank you for the, the way that in an artistic way, the wonderful truth of Jesus and his being complete and him being the total and final sacrifice for our sins is made so clear and as the light shines through these two windows, may they enlighten our lives and draw us deeper and deeper into your love and your care and your keeping. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. As we close our service this morning, I want us to sing two verses of hymn number 475, Deeper, Deeper in the love of Jesus. We'll sing verses one and two. And let's stand together as we sing. <laughs> 